What is a tropical storm? You can think of a tropical storm as a less intense hurricane. You can also call a hurricane a more intense tropical storm. If wind speeds are between 38 and 74 miles, 61 and 119 kilometers per hour, then it is considered a tropical storm and not a hurricane. What are spiral bands? The clouds arranged in curving bands that form the outside of a hurricane rather like those in a spiral galaxy are called spiral bands. They can extend for several hundred miles beyond the eye of the hurricane. What are spiral bands? The clouds arranged in curving bands that form the outside of a hurricane rather like those in a spiral galaxy are called spiral bands. They can extend for several hundred miles beyond the eye of the hurricane. What is a concentric eye wall? Most hurricanes are centered around one eye, but sometimes a secondary eye wall surrounds this eye. The second eye wall surrounds the first, and is thus called a concentric eye wall. What is a concentric eye wall? Most hurricanes are centered around one eye, but sometimes a secondary eye wall surrounds this eye. The second eye wall surrounds the first, and is thus called a concentric eye wall. What is a hypercane? Professor Carrie Emanuel at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is an authority on using computer models to simulate hurricane activity. In one extreme scenario, Emmanuel hypothesized what might happen if a large asteroid hit one of Earth's oceans. Of course, there would be monstrous waves and immense heat generated by the impact. But there would be another side effect as well, a hypercane. A hypercane would occur after the impact because deep ocean waters would heat up. The result would be a strange hurricane that would only be about 10 to 20 miles. 16 to 32 kilometers across but would have incredible winds reaching 500 miles, 800 kilometers per hour. Such a hypercane would also be capable of jettisoning moisture upwards of 25 miles. 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. What is a hypercane?
Professor Carrie Emanuel at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Is an authority on using computer models to simulate hurricane activity. In one extreme scenario, Emanuel hypothesized what might happen if a large asteroid hit one of Earth's oceans. Of course, there would be monstrous waves and immense heat generated by the impact. But there would be another side effect as well, a hypercane. A hypercane would occur after the impact because deep ocean waters would heat up. The result would be a strange hurricane that would only be about 10 to 20 miles. 16 to 32 kilometers across but would have incredible winds reaching 500 miles, 800 kilometers per hour. Such a hypercane would also be capable of jettisoning moisture upwards of 25 miles. 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. What is the difference between a hurricane watch and a warning? Some would like with tornado watches and warnings. A hurricane watch means that conditions are good that a hurricane will form within the next 36 hours or so. A hurricane warning means that a hurricane is expected to make landfall within 24 hours. Warnings and watches are issued by the National Weather Service's National Hurricane Center. What is the difference between a hurricane watch and a warning? Some would like with tornado watches and warnings. A hurricane watch means that conditions are good that a hurricane will form within the next 36 hours or so. A hurricane warning means that a hurricane is expected to make landfall within 24 hours. Warnings and watches are issued by the National Weather Service's National Hurricane Center. What is the National Hurricane Center? Based at Florida International University near Miami. The National Hurricane Center is part of the National Weather Service. Its mission is to predict and warn of dangerous hurricanes in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. The headquarters building itself is heavily fortified against hurricanes. Having 10 inch thick walls, roll down shutters for its windows. And being far enough inland to be safe from storm surges, it is designed to survive 130 mile, 210 kilometer per hour winds so that it can still be operational after almost any hurricane. What is the National Hurricane Center? Based at Florida International University near Miami. The National Hurricane Center is part of the National Weather Service. Its mission is to predict and warn of dangerous hurricanes in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. The headquarters building itself is heavily fortified against hurricanes. Having 10 inch thick walls, roll down shutters for its windows. 
and being far enough inland to be safe from storm surges, it is designed to survive 130 mile, 210 kilometer per hour winds so that it can still be operational after almost any hurricane. How much energy can a hurricane produce? An average hurricane can strike with a force equivalent to about 400 hydrogen bombs. Each packing 20 megatons of explosive power. How much energy can a hurricane produce? An average hurricane can strike with a force equivalent to about 400 hydrogen bombs. Each packing 20 megatons of explosive power. Can a hurricane be stopped? For all practical purposes, no. Proposals have been suggested. Such as cloud seeding techniques, but to date science has yet to come up with a solution. During the 1950s, the U.S. federal government launched the Storm Fury Project, which was an effort to dump silver iodide crystals near the eyes of hurricanes. The theory was that the seeding would generate a secondary eye in the storm, which would then hamper or even cause the original eye to collapse. Several experiments were conducted in 1961, 1963, 1969, and 1971, but while sometimes the results seemed promising, the data was inconclusive. Hurricane Esther, in 1961, appeared to be weakened by as much as 30% through seeding. But there was no proof that the storm didn't just weaken all by itself. The government gave up the project in the 1970s, and while private companies have continued some of this research, most meteorologists believe that there is just no practical way to destroy a hurricane. The problem seems to be the fact that, for it to work, cloud seeding requires supercooled water. But hurricane clouds contain insufficient supercooled moisture. Can a hurricane be stopped? For all practical purposes, no. Proposals have been suggested. Such as cloud seeding techniques, but to date science has yet to come up with a solution. During the 1950s, the U.S. federal government launched the Storm Fury Project, which was an effort to dump silver iodide crystals near the eyes of hurricanes. The theory was that the seeding would generate a secondary eye in the storm, which would then hamper or even cause the original eye to collapse. Several experiments were conducted in 1961, 1963, 1969, and 1971, but while sometimes the results seemed promising, the data was inconclusive. Hurricane Esther, in 1961, 
appeared to be weakened by as much as 30% through seeding. But there was no proof that the storm didn't just weaken all by itself. The government gave up the project in the 1970s, and while private companies have continued some of this research, most meteorologists believe that there is just no practical way to destroy a hurricane. The problem seems to be the fact that, for it to work, cloud seeding requires supercooled water. But hurricane clouds contain insufficient supercooled moisture. Where in the tropics are you safe from a hurricane? Hurricanes do not strike within 5 degrees latitude on either side of the equator. Therefore, if you wish to live in the sunny tropics and have a healthy fear of hurricanes, you may want to investigate real estate deals near the equator. Where in the tropics are you safe from a hurricane? Hurricanes do not strike within 5 degrees latitude on either side of the equator. Therefore, if you wish to live in the sunny tropics and have a healthy fear of hurricanes, you may want to investigate real estate deals near the equator. What was the storm that wouldn't die? In November 1992 Typhoon Gay lasted for days as it traveled thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean. Eventually making landfall in Alaska, British Columbia, and California. At its peak, the storm boasted winds of 200 miles, 322 kilometers, per hour. After making landfall in the United States, it continued across the Great Plains. Then regained strength as it reached the East Coast. Here. It became a new storm on December 11th with winds of about 90 miles, 145 kilometers, per hour. What was the storm that wouldn't die? In November 1992 Typhoon Gay lasted for days as it traveled thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean. Eventually making landfall in Alaska, British Columbia, and California. At its peak, the storm boasted winds of 200 miles, 322 kilometers, per hour. After making landfall in the United States, it continued across the Great Plains. Then regained strength as it reached the East Coast. Here. It became a new storm on December 11th with winds of about 90 miles, 145 kilometers per hour. What was the great hurricane of 1938? Possibly the worst storm to ever hit the American Northeast since the arrival of Europeans. 
the Great Hurricane of 1938 wreaked havoc throughout New England and down as far as Long Island. 600 people died as a result of the storm in what has also been called the Long Island Express. What was the Great Hurricane of 1938? Possibly the worst storm to ever hit the American Northeast since the arrival of Europeans. The Great Hurricane of 1938 wreaked havoc throughout New England and down as far as Long Island. 600 people died as a result of the storm in what has also been called the Long Island Express. What was Hurricane Katrina? Hurricane Katrina was the name given to the devastating hurricane that developed in the Atlantic Ocean. Crossed the Gulf of Mexico. And struck New Orleans and many other cities along the southern coast of the United States in late August 2005. What was Hurricane Katrina? Hurricane Katrina was the name given to the devastating hurricane that developed in the Atlantic Ocean. Crossed the Gulf of Mexico. And struck New Orleans and many other cities along the southern coast of the United States in late August 2005. How many people died as a result of the subsequent failure of the levees and flooding after Hurricane Katrina struck? The accepted final figures state that 1. 836 people lost their lives following the landfall of Hurricane Katrina. 2. How many people died as a result of the subsequent failure of the levees and flooding after Hurricane Katrina struck? The accepted final figures state that 1. 836 people lost their lives following the landfall of Hurricane Katrina. 2. What is diamond dust? Diamond dust, also known as ice prisms, are tiny ice crystals that can form in the air on extremely cold days if the air contains enough moisture. The effect can be quite beautiful, as sparkling, barely visible crystals appear in mid-air on sunny days. Catching the sunlight and, indeed, appearing as if they are tiny diamond chips wafting in the breeze. Can the form of snowflake crystals be predicted? Snowflake crystals come in several forms. Including needle-shaped, plate-like, capped columns, 
and feathery dendrites. Temperature and humidity levels determine which type of shape is formed, so, yes. If these conditions are known, the type of snowflake formed could be predicted. In natural conditions, this would of course be impractical. But laboratory conditions could be established to form particular types of snow crystals, if desired. As for the future, who knows? Hurricanes seem to be increasing in size and number in the 21st century. And it is possible that one could travel across, say, northern Mexico and then reach southern California. Does the Coriolis effect make the water in my toilet, sink, and bathtub swirl clockwise? No, the Coriolis effect has very little effect on such small bodies of water. The flow down the drain is mostly a function of the shape of the container. Interestingly, if your body were completely symmetrical, and no one's is, and neither leg were longer and you were walking on perfectly flat land then you might start veering due to the Coriolis effect. What is the difference between snow and hail? Snow is water vapor that freezes in clouds before falling to the earth. Hail is water droplets, raindrops, that have turned to ice in clouds. How much energy can a hurricane produce? An average hurricane can strike with a force equivalent to about 400 hydrogen bombs. Each packing 20 megatons of explosive power. What was the Great Hurricane of 1938? Possibly the worst storm to ever hit the American Northeast since the arrival of Europeans. The Great Hurricane of 1938 wreaked havoc throughout New England and down as far as Long Island. 600 people died as a result of the storm in what has also been called the Long Island Express. Besides rime frost, what other types of frost are there? Different weather conditions can cause frost to form in various ways. Sometimes with spectacularly beautiful results. The types of frost include, advection, wind. Frost is frost that forms on the edges of plants and other objects. Advection frost is formed on the upwind side of objects during very cold winds. Fern, window, frost gets its name from the fern-like patterns it forms on windows. Especially windows that are not well insulated. 
Flaws in the glass's surface provide the nucleus needed for water vapors to form crystals, which then radiate outwards in intricate patterns. Frost flowers are the result of a rare interaction between plants and the weather. When water inside a plant stem cracks or splits due to the cold, the water can escape and then freeze into flower like shapes. Because they are so fragile, frost flowers usually break apart or melt within hours of forming. Hoar, radiation, frost is formed on clear nights when surface objects are colder than the surrounding air. It appears as white, loosely organized crystals. Hoarfrost may appear similar to rime, but unlike rime it is formed without the presence of mist or fog. Has there ever been a hurricane in Great Britain? Well, what really occurred in Great Britain was a very intense low pressure system with hurricane force winds. On January 25, 1990, a storm with winds up to 120 miles, 193 kilometers per hour hit Great Britain, killing 45 people and causing over $1 billion in damage. Even so, Brits often remember the Great Storm of 1987 even less fondly. Though it cannot be classified as a hurricane, hurricanes are tropical events only. It killed 18 people and was, at that time, the worst storm to hit the British Isles in the last three centuries. How many people died as a result of the subsequent failure of the levees and flooding after Hurricane Katrina struck? The accepted final figures state that one. 836 people lost their lives following the landfall of Hurricane Katrina. What part of a hurricane is most damaging? Floods caused by hurricane storm surges are the most destructive element. The low pressure center of a hurricane causes a mound of water to rise above the surrounding water. This hill of water is pushed by the hurricane's fierce winds and low pressure onto the land. Where it floods coastal communities, causing significant damage. Hurricanes sometimes spark tornadoes that contribute to the devastation. How unhealthy is snow shoveling? Heart attack rates increase sharply during the winter months in northern climates. Because people who are older or are not very healthy get too much exercise shoveling snow. Because more men than women tend to shovel snow. About three-fourths of winter fatalities after snowstorms are men. 50% of these men, too are over 60 years of age.
What is a hypercane? Professor Carey Emanuel at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is an authority on using computer models to simulate hurricane activity. In one extreme scenario, Emanuel hypothesized what might happen if a large asteroid hit one of Earth's oceans. Of course, there would be monstrous waves and immense heat generated by the impact. But there would be another side effect as well, a hypercane. A hypercane would occur after the impact because deep ocean waters would heat up. The result would be a strange hurricane that would only be about 10 to 20 miles. 16 to 32 kilometers, across but would have incredible winds reaching 500 miles, 800 kilometers, per hour. Such a hypercane would also be capable of jettisoning moisture upwards of 25 miles. 40 kilometers, into the atmosphere. Is there a classification system for snowflakes? Humankind has an affinity for classifying just about anything, and that includes snowflakes. In 1951, the International Commission on Snow and Ice, yes, there was such a commission created a system for putting a name on each type of snowflake a daunting task when one considers that no two flakes are alike. What is a tropical depression? A tropical depression consists of a line of organized storms with wind speeds below 38 miles. 61 kilometers per hour. Tropical depressions have the potential to become tropical storms or hurricanes. Who created the first artificial snowflake? Japanese physicist Yukichiro Nakaya, 1900-1962, created the first artificial snowflakes. At Hokkaido University in 1936, Nakaya who was inspired by the photographs of Wilson A. Bentley, 1865-1931, also devised a rather poetic snowflake classification system, which he described in his 1954 book, Snow Crystals, Natural and Artificial. How much water is contained in snow? Depending on conditions and as anyone who has had to shovel snow can. A test to snow can range from light and fluffy to heavy, dense, and slushy. As a general rule of thumb, however, Every 10 inches of snowfall that accumulates on the ground would equal about an inch of rain if it all melted. What was the storm that wouldn't die?
In November 1992 Typhoon Gay lasted for days as it traveled thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean. Eventually making landfall in Alaska, British Columbia, and California. At its peak, the storm boasted winds of 200 miles, 322 kilometers, per hour. After making landfall in the United States, it continued across the Great Plains. Then regained strength as it reached the East Coast. Here. It became a new storm on December 11 with winds of about 90 miles, 145 kilometers, per hour. Can a hurricane be stopped? For all practical purposes, no. Proposals have been suggested. Such as cloud seeding techniques, but to date science has yet to come up with a solution. During the 1950s, the U.S. federal government launched the Storm Fury Project. Which was an effort to dump silver iodide crystals near the eyes of hurricanes. The theory was that the seeding would generate a secondary eye in the storm. Which would then hamper or even cause the original eye to collapse. Several experiments were conducted in 1961, 1963, 1969, and 1971, but while sometimes the results seemed promising, the data was inconclusive. Hurricane Esther, in 1961, appeared to be weakened by as much as 30% through seeding. But there was no proof that the storm didn't just weaken all by itself. The government gave up the project in the 1970s, and while private companies have continued some of this research, most meteorologists believe that there is just no practical way to destroy a hurricane. The problem seems to be the fact that, for it to work, cloud seeding requires supercooled water. But hurricane clouds contain insufficient supercooled moisture. Is a polar low like an Arctic hurricane? Some strong hurricanes such as 1992's Hurricane Andrew have continued to be active while traveling as far north as the Arctic. But at that point they are no longer considered tropical storms or hurricanes. There is also something called a polar low. Which is like a small hurricane that can form above the Arctic Circle. Polar lows, extratropical lows, tend to range from 50 to 250 miles, 100 to 500 kilometers. In diameter, versus tropical hurricanes that are easily twice as big in many cases. Not only are they smaller, but polar lows tend to have a shorter lifespan than southern hurricanes. Rarely lasting more than 36 hours and more typically only about 12 hours. However, they can still be very intense, generating strong winds and heavy snowfalls. What was Hurricane Katrina? Hurricane Katrina was the name given to the devastating hurricane that developed in the Atlantic Ocean. 
across the Gulf of Mexico and struck New Orleans and many other cities along the southern coast of the United States in late August 2005. When were huge snowflakes observed? In January 28. 1887, in Ft. Kia, Montana, there was a snowfall that included flakes measuring a spectacular 15 inches. 38.1 centimeters, across. Of course, these flakes were not individual crystals. But rather clumps of crystals sticking together to form large flakes. Not long after these stunning flakes were seen, Shire Newton, England, experienced a storm in 1888 where 3.75 inch, 9.5 centimeter, snowflakes were seen. What are spiral bands? The clouds arranged in curving bands that form the outside of a hurricane rather like those in a spiral galaxy are called spiral bands. They can extend for several hundred miles beyond the eye of the hurricane. Why don't we see hurricanes in the South Atlantic Ocean? The cold sea surface temperatures of the South Atlantic and atmospheric conditions, such as the tendency of the intertropical convergence zone to remain in the northern hemisphere, make hurricane formation south of the equator unlikely. However, in March 2004, a hurricane did strike the coast of Brazil, which was a very unusual event. What is the Fujiwara effect? Named after Japanese meteorologist Sakahe Fujiwara, 1884-1950, the Fujiwara effect is what happens when two hurricanes come close enough to each other that they begin to rotate around a common central point. For this to occur, the two storms generally need to come to within 300 to 900 miles. 500 to 1,500 kilometers, of each other, they also need to be of about equal strength to remain in this partnered dance. Or else the stronger storm tends to swallow up the smaller storm. What is the difference between a hurricane watch and a warning? Some would like with tornado watches and warnings. A hurricane watch means that conditions are good that a hurricane will form within the next 36 hours or so. A hurricane warning means that a hurricane is expected to make landfall within 24 hours. Warnings and watches are issued by the National Weather Service's National Hurricane Center. Who was the snowflake man?
American photographer and farmer Wilson A. Bentley, 1865-1931, was nicknamed the Snowflake Man, or just Snowflake Bentley. Because he photographed images of over 2,400 snowflakes. His stunning photo collection capturing the natural. Beauty of Snowflakes was published in 1931 Snow Crystals. Needles look just like the name, thin, long ice crystals. They usually form when the temperature is about 23 degrees Fahrenheit minus 5 degrees Celsius. Triangular crystals often form at temperatures of about 28 degrees Fahrenheit minus 2 degrees Celsius. And are rather like deformed stellar flakes where half the arms are not fully formed, creating a triangle shape as a result. Bullet rosettes happen when several columns melt and freeze together. Looking like several crystal bullets merged at the heads at odd angles to each other. Rhymed crystals occur when additional water droplets freeze onto already formed snowflakes. Giving them a fuzzy appearance. Irregular crystals are snowflakes that are rather disorganized. Mess of multiple snowflakes that have broken up and melted together. What is a concentric eye wall? Most hurricanes are centered around one eye, but sometimes a secondary eye wall surrounds this eye. The second eye wall surrounds the first, and is thus called a concentric eye wall. What is the National Hurricane Center? Based at Florida International University near Miami. The National Hurricane Center is part of the National Weather Service. Its mission is to predict and warn of dangerous hurricanes in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. The headquarters building itself is heavily fortified against hurricanes. Having 10 inch thick walls, roll down shutters for its windows. And being far enough inland to be safe from storm surges, it is designed to survive 130 mile, 210 kilometer per hour winds so that it can still be operational after almost any hurricane. What is the Coriolis effect? Named after French mathematician scientist Gustave Coriolis, 1792-1843. Who first explained it in 1835, the Coriolis effect refers to the way objects appear to move in a curving or circular pattern when observed from a point of view position that is rotating. Imagine yourself standing next to a playground carousel. Two of your friends are riding on opposite sides of the carousel as it spins around. One friend holds a ball and tries to roll it to the person on the other side. But as he does so, the ball seems to veer to one side and roll off the carousel. To your point of view, as you stand off to the side, however, the ball rolled in a straight line. But it did not reach your other friend because as the ball moved across the 
carousel moved beneath it and the intended receiver was no longer in the original position. Now imagine the earth as it spins on its axis. Above the earth, suspended in the atmosphere, is a forming hurricane. The air around the hurricane is moving toward the eye, which is where the lowest air pressure is. However, as the air moves toward the eye, it is deflected to the right. In the northern hemisphere, by the earth's spin, or to the left, in the southern hemisphere, this causes the hurricane clouds to rotate counterclockwise in the north and clockwise in the south. Is it true that no two snowflakes are exactly the same shape? Some snowflakes may have strikingly similar shapes, but these twins are probably not molecularly identical. In 1986, cloud physicist Nancy Knight believed she found a uniquely cloned pair of crystals on an oil-coated slide that had been hanging from an airplane. This pair may have been the result of breaking off from a star crystal or were attached side by side, thereby experiencing the same weather conditions simultaneously. Unfortunately the smaller aspects of each of the snow crystals could not be studied because the photograph was unable to capture possible molecular differences. So, even if the human eye may see twin flakes, on a minuscule level these flakes are different. What is a storm surge? Not to be confused with a tsunami, a storm surge is a sudden upwelling of ocean water caused by winds and pressure changes affecting the water's surface. Hurricanes generate large wave swells that radiate outwards in all directions as they travel over the ocean. The swells, which can move toward the shoreline about three or four times faster than the actual storm, arrive on land before hurricanes strike. Before advanced weather systems and the use of satellites. These swells warned people that a hurricane was approaching. The swells become storm surges by the time the main storm arrives. Raising water levels as much as 25 feet, 7.5 meters, and causing massive coastal flooding. By some estimates, the storm surge resulting from 2005's Hurricane Katrina was 28 feet, 8.5 meters. How fast do hurricanes travel? A typical hurricane will travel across the ocean at a speed of about 250 miles. 400 kilometers per day, or about 10 to 15 miles, 16 to 24 kilometers per hour. They have been known, though, to advance at speeds as fast as 60 miles. 96.5 kilometers per hour, which was the case during the New England hurricane of 1938. Has a hurricane ever made landfall in Southern California?
while tropical storms have, rarely, reached Southern California. There is no record of a hurricane ever reaching the coastline there. A deadly tropical storm took 45 lives in 1939, and tropical. Storm Kathleen caused lots of flooding on September 10, 1976. Where in the tropics are you safe from a hurricane? Hurricanes do not strike within 5 degrees latitude on either side of the equator. Therefore, if you wish to live in the sunny tropics and have a healthy fear of hurricanes, you may want to investigate real estate deals near the equator. What are the types of snowflakes as identified in the International Classification System? The types of snowflakes have been stellar plates, as the name indicates, are star-like flakes that are flat. Distinctly hexagonal, with six broad arms. Sectored plates are similar to stellar plates, but also have prominent ridges pointing to each of the six facets in the plate. Double plates occur when two stellar plates are connected by a cap. Usually, one plate is much larger than the other. Split plates and stars happen when parts of two separate plates merge to form one plate that if not closely inspected, looks like a single six-armed plate. For example, a partial plate containing two arms could merge with one that has four arms left. Leaving a six-armed plate that appears like a complete single plate. Simple prisms tiny, six-armed. Flat snowflakes that are hard to distinguish with the naked eye, but are a very common form. Stellar dendrites have tree-like arms, dendritic means tree-like, with multiple branches extending from each of the six arms. Fern-like stellar dendrites are stellar dendrites with more frilly, fern-like branches. Radiating dendrites Spatial dendrites are dendrites that have arms extending not just in two dimensions, but in three. Capped columns look like columns that have six flat sides. Imagine two hexagons that are joined together. Hollow columns are similar to capped columns, except the ends of the columns are hollow or devoted. 12-sided snowflakes when two six-sided plates join together at a 30-degree angle. They form what appears to be a 12-armed plate or capped column. Was the 2005 New Orleans disaster caused by a flood or a hurricane? The initial cause of the disaster was Hurricane Katrina, which whipped up tides and sea water against a very fragile levee system that protected New Orleans. The city is 49% below sea level, and so when the man made levees broke, flood waters moved in and inundated much of the city.
was the 2005 New Orleans disaster caused by a flood or a hurricane. The initial cause of the disaster was Hurricane Katrina, which whipped up tides and sea water against a very fragile levee system that protected New Orleans. The city is 49% below sea level, and so when the man made levees broke, flood waters moved in and inundated much of the city. How much rain does it take to make a flood? The amount varies widely for different areas. In some U.S. western deserts, or in some large urban areas. Just a few minutes of strong rain will cause a flash flood in canyons and low-lying areas. In areas prone to greater rainfall amounts, it often takes quite a bit more rain. Sometimes a few days or weeks worth, to cause rivers to overflow and dams to fill up. Raising concerns of those who live downstream. Areas that normally receive more rainfall have better natural drainage. Systems and are usually home to plants that readily absorb the extra water. How much rain does it take to make a flood? The amount varies widely for different areas. In some U.S. western deserts, or in some large urban areas. Just a few minutes of strong rain will cause a flash flood in canyons and low-lying areas. In areas prone to greater rainfall amounts, it often takes quite a bit more rain. Sometimes a few days or weeks worth, to cause rivers to overflow and dams to fill up. Raising concerns of those who live downstream. Areas that normally receive more rainfall have better natural drainage. Systems and are usually home to plants that readily absorb the extra water. What causes a flood? Flooding results when more water enters an environment than can be easily absorbed into the soil or drained away in rivers and streams. Flooding is usually caused by intense rainfalls that dump many inches of water onto an area over a short period of time, or they can also be caused by ocean swells and Storm surges initiated by hurricanes and tropical storms. Tsunamis, naturally, also cause flooding. The 2004 tsunamis that resulted in an undersea earthquake in the Indian Ocean. For instance, killed about 238,000 people in 11 surrounding countries. Most of these people died from the initial landfall of the waves and resulting floods. In addition, floods can be caused artificially, such as when a dam or levee breaks. What causes a flood?
Flooding results when more water enters an environment than can be easily absorbed into the soil or drained away in rivers and streams. Flooding is usually caused by intense rainfalls that dump many inches of water onto an area over a short period of time, or they can also be caused by ocean swells and storm surges initiated by hurricanes and tropical storms. Tsunamis, naturally, also cause flooding. The 2004 tsunamis that resulted in an undersea earthquake in the Indian Ocean. For instance, killed about 238,000 people in 11 surrounding countries. Most of these people died from the initial landfall of the waves and resulting floods. In addition, floods can be caused artificially, such as when a dam or levee breaks. What is a flash flood? Floods can happen relatively gradually, such as when water slowly rises over the banks of a river or lake. Or suddenly, such as when a dam or levee is damaged. When a flood happens quickly, it's called a flash flood. What is a flash flood? Floods can happen relatively gradually, such as when water slowly rises over the banks of a river or lake. Or suddenly, such as when a dam or levee is damaged. When a flood happens quickly, it's called a flash flood. What caused all the flooding in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina? Most people now agree that the destruction of New Orleans could have largely been avoided had the canal levees, built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, been up to the task of controlling the storm surges. Because many of the levees failed, 80% of the city was engulfed in water. What caused all the flooding in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina? Most people now agree that the destruction of New Orleans could have largely been avoided had the canal levees, built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, been up to the task of controlling the storm surges. Because many of the levees failed, 80% of the city was engulfed in water. Why do flash floods kill so many people? Simply put, people don't seem to recognize the power of flash floods and the fact that even a half foot of rushing water can knock down an adult and sweep him or her away. Moving flood waters just a few feet deep are capable of pushing cars and small trucks. Floods can either drown you, or they can kill you by carrying deadly debris. The other factor, of course, 
is that flash floods catch people by surprise. And if they happen at night, those who are sleeping can certainly be caught unawares. Sometimes, too, people can just lack a little common sense. There have been many stories of people who were standing in dry riverbeds when a flash flood suddenly barreled down on them, instead of running up the river bank and to safety. They ran downriver in the vain hope of outrunning the rushing waters. This is how a number of deaths occurred during the 1976 flood that hit Big Thompson, Colorado. Why do flash floods kill so many people? Simply put, people don't seem to recognize the power of flash floods and the fact that even a half foot of rushing water can knock down an adult and sweep him or her away. Moving flood waters just a few feet deep are capable of pushing cars and small trucks. Floods can either drown you, or they can kill you by carrying deadly debris. The other factor, of course, is that flash floods catch people by surprise. And if they happen at night, those who are sleeping can certainly be caught unawares. Sometimes, too, people can just lack a little common sense. There have been many stories of people who were standing in dry riverbeds when a flash flood suddenly barreled down on them, instead of running up the river bank and to safety. They ran downriver in the vain hope of outrunning the rushing waters. This is how a number of deaths occurred during the 1976 flood that hit Big Thompson, Colorado. What do many scholars believe caused the flood that Noah and his family survived in the Bible? Some archaeologists believe that, sometime between the years 5400 B.C.E. and 5200 B.C.E., the Euphrates River flooded the surrounding valley, covering an area of about 40,000 square miles, about 104,000 square kilometers. Although this flood did not encompass the globe, to those living in the area it certainly would have seemed like the end of the world and it could have inspired the well-known biblical story. What do many scholars believe caused the flood that Noah and his family survived in the Bible? Some archaeologists believe that, sometime between the years 5400 B.C.E. and 5200 B.C.E., the Euphrates River flooded the surrounding valley, covering an area of about 40,000 square miles, about 104,000 square kilometers. Although this flood did not encompass the globe, to those living in the area it certainly would have seemed like the end of the world and it could have inspired the well-known biblical story. What are some of the worst floods in history caused by inclement weather?
Not all lethal floods in recorded history have been caused by bad weather. For example, seawall failures in the Netherlands have on several occasions, caused tragic floods that killed thousands. The table below, though, lists some of the worst weather-related floods in history. What are some of the worst floods in history caused by inclement weather? Not all lethal floods in recorded history have been caused by bad weather. For example, seawall failures in the Netherlands have on several occasions, caused tragic floods that killed thousands. The table below, though, lists some of the worst weather-related floods in history. What was the Great Flood of 1993? Heavy rainfall caused river flooding in 1993 that was so severe in Iowa that when observed by NOAA sensors, the state looked like a sixth Great Lake. The Mississippi River was seven miles wide at some points, and the Missouri River also spilled over its banks, causing nearly $20 billion in property losses, 48 deaths, and the evacuation of 85,000 people. What was the Great Flood of 1993? Heavy rainfall caused river flooding in 1993 that was so severe in Iowa that when observed by NOAA sensors, the state looked like a sixth Great Lake. The Mississippi River was seven miles wide at some points, and the Missouri River also spilled over its banks, causing nearly $20 billion in property losses, 48 deaths, and the evacuation of 85,000 people. What have been some of the most destructive floods in history? In the United States, the failure of a dam in 1889 upstream from the community of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, killed 2,200 people. Some of the world's most catastrophic flooding takes place in China. A flood on the Huanghe River in 1931 killed 3.1 million people. What have been some of the most destructive floods in history? In the United States, the failure of a dam in 1889 upstream from the community of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, killed 2,200 people. Some of the world's most catastrophic flooding takes place in China. A flood on the Huanghe River in 1931 killed 3.1 million people. What is a floodplain?
A floodplain is the area surrounding a river that, when unmodified by human structures, would normally be flooded during a river flood. A floodplain can be a few feet or many miles wide. Depending on the river flow as well as the local terrain. Even though levees and flood walls can be built. With homes and businesses built just behind them, the floodplain does not vanish. If the structures break or are damaged, the water from a flood can fill a floodplain. Just as it did before humans occupied it. What is a floodplain? A floodplain is the area surrounding a river that, when unmodified by human structures, would normally be flooded during a river flood. A floodplain can be a few feet or many miles wide. Depending on the river flow as well as the local terrain. Even though levees and flood walls can be built. With homes and businesses built just behind them, the floodplain does not vanish. If the structures break or are damaged, the water from a flood can fill a floodplain. Just as it did before humans occupied it. Why do people live in floodplains? People have lived in floodplains for thousands of years. Fertile land for agriculture lines the floodplain, and the nearby water source makes life easier. Unfortunately, when the river does flood, these communities are severely damaged and people suffer. Hazard mitigation, such as levees, dams, dikes and other structures, attempt to limit damage during floods. Sometimes, when the structures fail, such as a levee breaking, large areas are inundated with water. Inhabitants of floodplains must balance the risks with the rewards of living in such an unpredictable environment. Why do people live in floodplains? People have lived in floodplains for thousands of years. Fertile land for agriculture lines the floodplain, and the nearby water source makes life easier. Unfortunately, when the river does flood, these communities are severely damaged and people suffer. Hazard mitigation, such as levees, dams, dikes and other structures, attempt to limit damage during floods. Sometimes, when the structures fail, such as a levee breaking, large areas are inundated with water. Inhabitants of floodplains must balance the risks with the rewards of living in such an unpredictable environment. What are you seeing when you see your breath? It can be fun for kids to breathe out on a cold day and pretend that they are perhaps dragons. But it is obviously not smoke coming out of their mouths, it is water vapor. 
what is happening is that the moisture in one's breath, humidity, is turning to fog as it leaves the warm confines of the mouth and hits the chilly air. While one or two people breathing out on cold days will not affect the weather. It has been observed that large herds of animals huddling together on a winter's day can actually produce a small fog bank. How many Category 5 hurricanes have there been since 1920? The Saffir-Simpson scale was not invented until 1971, however. Reliable records on hurricane wind speeds and storm surges have been kept since the 1920s. According to such data, there have been 31 Category 5 hurricanes in the Atlantic since 1928. Eight. Of those have occurred since 2003, four in 2005 alone, which is one piece of evidence some. Climatologists point to when talking about global warming and its effects on tropical storm intensity. Of all those hurricanes, only four have actually made landfall on U.S. territory. Others have struck Central America or islands in the Caribbean, or they have weakened to Category 4 or below before reaching Puerto Rico or the Gulf Coast or Atlantic Seaboard. Below is a chronological list of Category 5 hurricanes.